بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد so inshallah we carry on our commentary on Surah Al-A'raf and inshallah hopefully inshallah we will be able to uh, complete the commentary on the surah um, again just to reiterate the central theme in the surah what the, th- what the surah talks about is expressed clearly in verse number two kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru kitabun anzalnahu ilayka kitabun anzalnahu ilayka fala yakun fi sadrika haraju minhu litunzira bihi wa dhikra lil mu'minin it's a book that we have sent down upon you O muhammad so that uh, uh, so let the response of these people or the burden of conveying this message, this whole mission, let them not bring you down. Uh, so that, so there's a book and then there is your experience in delivering the message of Muhammad and what you go through. And then third, eventually there will be warning and reminder, warning to the disbelievers, those who reject the truth, and a reminder basically for those who have accepted the truth. And we said Allah mentioned it, Allah says, وَذِكْرَى لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Because Iman is not actually acquiring something, essentially. Iman is not acquiring something. Iman is more about awakening the nature of, the human nature in terms of faith, the fitrah. It's more of it's not an acquiring, but it's a recovery of something. That would be a good way to put it. Fitra. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith, كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ Each child is born in a state of fitra. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Rum, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا And set your face straight. Uh, to the, uh, to the straight path or to the religion, which is the deen of Islam. Hanifa, taking that straight path. Fitrat Allah, it is this religion, this way, is the fitra, is the natural state according to which or in which Allah created humans. Allah set humans in that state, fitra naturally. This is the religion. So Allah set them, humans, their default state is identical to this religion. So this is why the Qur'an is mentioned as a reminder, as a reminder, dhikra. Allah says to the Prophet, وَذَكِّرْ bihi," And remind with it. Why? Because in a sense, it's a recovery. Imam Al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says, مَصَابِيحُ الْقُلُوبُ الطَّاهِرَةِ مُضِيئَةٌ قَبْلَ إِنزَالِ الشَّرَائِعِ The lights of the pure hearts are already shining even before the revelation or the descending of revelation. That doesn't mean humans can do without revelation. They cannot. But this is the seed that the revelation helps grow and flourish. So that's the the dynamics of faith, the dynamics of Iman. So we said, Allah SWT in this surah says, there's three main points in Surah Al-A'raf. There is a book that is sent to you, O Muhammad. So there will be references to the book and its message. Number two, your experience in conveying this message, there will, some elements will pull you down. Don't you know, fall for that. Don't fall for that. Uh, and the third one is that the outcome of your message will be believers and disbelievers. Those who accept the truth, those who reject the truth. Those who accept the truth, this book will serve as a reminder to them, would have served as a reminder to them. The ones who reject the truth, it would serve as a warning. JazakAllah khair. Okay, so the whole story revolves around this. The things we covered mentioned clearly. Uh, a lot of them were referenced to what the Quran really said, what the message is about, and to show the end of the disbelievers, that's the warning. To show the good end of the believers, that's actually the reminder and the good news. And then the stories of the prophets that we mentioned are actually quite like long here are a consolation to the Prophet Muhammad saying to him, you know what you are going through, prophets and messengers before you went through the same thing or through similar things. 
But we saw also something that we could glean from these stories that the challenges that the prophets and messengers had to deal with, they were combined for Prophet Muhammad وسلم, because he's the final messenger and he's bringing the final messages that will remain with humanity till the day of judgment. So all the challenges that the prophets, previous prophets went through were all combined in the case of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We reached the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam and we said this is probably the longest version of, uh, the longest or the second longest after Surah Taha, story of Prophet, the version, a version of the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And there is a reason, there is a lot of similarity between what Prophet Musa alayhi salam had to face and what Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had to face. And this is one of the reasons why the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam appears many times in the Quran. What, the, what Prophet Muhammad وسلم, went through, there's a lot of similarity, there's a lot in, in common with what the story or what Prophet Musa alayhi salam, had to go through. Also, the lessons of the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, will always come in handy to those who uphold the truth. Because it's a struggle against tyrannical power that embraces disbelief and upholds disbelief and fights for it and is extremely vicious and unforgiving when it comes to crushing the truth and the people who uphold it. Fir'aun. Fir'aun. Fir'aun is the symbol of tyranny, arrogance and disbelief. As well as says, And we made them leaders for the people of the fire. Fir'aun and his you know, ministers, his supporters, his people. These are the leaders. This is why the Prophet ﷺ, when he faced the biggest opposition and tyranny and oppression in Mecca, it was from Abu Jahl. The Prophet ﷺ said, He is the pharaoh of this ummah, Abu Jahl is the pharaoh, Fir'aun, of this ummah, of ummah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, <clears throat> let's see what, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoles Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the surah of, <coughs> of uh, Musa alayhi salam. Allah says, ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَا Verse number 103, ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ مُوسَى بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَى فِرْعَوْنَ وَمَلَئِهِ فَظَلَمُوا بِهَا فَانْظُرْ كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُفْسِدِينَ Then, after these prophets, we sent Musa with our signs, with our, with our verses to Fir'aun and his group, his gang. فَظَلَمُوا بِهَا They oppressed with it. What does that mean? They did not respond to it properly. They did not treat the signs of Allah properly. So they wronged the signs of Allah. They provided the wrong approach or the wrong response. فَانْظُرْ كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُفْسِدِينَ Allah says to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So contemplate, see, look at the outcome of those who bring about mischief. There are a few points here. This is a promise to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that you will win over the people of Quraysh if they oppose you. Because Allah says, the people of Fir'aun, they rejected Musa and his signs. The same thing, many of Quraysh, in the early stages, they rejected Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his message. وَظَلَمُوا بِهَا they, were oppre- they, they had an oppressive response, a tyrannical response. Allah says, contemplate the end of those who bring mischief. So that's, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing parallels between the story of Prophet Musa and the experience of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Now, Quraysh is still strong at this point when this verse was revealed. So that's a promise, that's a hint for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa basically saying that the end of these people shall be like the end of the Pharaoh. And the first signs of this happened in the battle of Badr, when Abu Jahl was killed in the battle of Badr, and he's the pharaoh of this ummah. وَقَالَ مُوسَىٰ يَا فِرْعَوْنُ إِنِّيَ رَسُولُ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ حَقِيقٌ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا أَقُولَ عَلَىٰ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ So Musa spoke directly to 
to the Pharaoh. And the Prophet Muhammad a big part of his mission in Mecca was speaking directly to the people of Mecca, to the leaders of Mecca, many times. The first instance where the Prophet gave da'wah was in that direct manner. So the first three years, most likely, of the da'wah of the Prophet was secret da'wah. It was one-to-one. -one. And the Prophet would pick the ones that are most likely to respond positively. But then, the command came to Prophet Muhammad in Surah Al-Shu'ara وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ And warn your tribe, your family that is closest to you. The Prophet went on a safa and he said يَا مَعْشَرَ قُرَيْشِ يَا بَنِي عَبْدِ الدَّارِ يَا بَنِي عَبْدِ الشَّمْسِ He started calling the different clans of Quraysh, summoning them. And this was like this kind of Conferencing was only done in extreme cases, in, in, in emergencies. So everyone realized this is a serious matter. They came to gather around Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's Prophet Muhammad Al-Amin, the honest, the truthful, the most balanced person in Mecca. The one that everyone looked up to, everyone respected. And he didn't have any political engagements or anything. And he says to them, if I were to tell you there's an army behind this mountain that is ready to attack you at the moment. Would you believe me? And there's no other signs, just my words. They said, we would take your word for it. Definitely. We never experienced any lie from you. The Prophet said, He said, I am a warner to you before a severe punishment from Allah. Like this took Mecca by surprise. Direct da'wah. This is what Musa السلام, had. He had to go to the Pharaoh in his face and give him the da'wah, face to face. For the Pharaoh, this was such a great challenge to his power and position. For many people in Mecca, this was a great challenge as well from Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to them. How come you challenge our way of life just like that, so simply and in public? Like these things should be discussed in private before you bring them to the public attention. But Prophet Muhammad وسلم, went straight as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him. So this is why, hence the response of his uncle, Abu Lahab. What did he say? He said, Tabban lak ali hadha jama'atan. He says, well, basically he swore at him. And he said, this is why you brought us here together? Obviously he wanted to ridicule, put down that his message and his calling. As if this was basically just a silly matter. Why would you bring us here? The same kind of ridicule was faced by Musa alayhi salam from the Pharaoh. He said, إِن كُنْتَ جِئْتَ بِآيَةٍ فَأْتِ بِهَا إِن كُنْتَ بِنَا If you're really a messenger from Allah, bring me a sign, prove it to me. Like, he didn't take him seriously. Deep inside, he did take him seriously, but he just pretended as if it was insignificant. So, Musa alayhi salam was ready, was prepared, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already gave him two major powerful signs. And, and the, the most powerful sign was the, the rod or the staff of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. He would throw it and it would turn into a real snake, real huge snake. And again, uh, the scholars of tafsir, they say uh, every prophet was sent with a miracle that was relevant to their time. And that makes full sense. Because Allah, there's a principle in the Quran. Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ And we've never sent a messenger except that he spoke the language of his people. And the word language is quite like inclusive. It's, it, it accommodates a lot in the language. So there is the language, yes, the spoken language, but language has culture within it, has cultural connotations. Like you could speak, for example, there are expressions in Canada here that if you use them in the UK, for example, they won't make sense. Well, the language is basically the same, right? But the expression is cultural. So there it won't make sense. It's not in use. That's part of language. So some scholars say language is quite an elusive, an, an, uh, an elastic term, and many things can be uh, included under it. Similarly, following from this principle, Allah sent every prophet speaking or with a miracle that the people can relate to, people can appreciate. 
And it was the hype, or let's say the trend of their time. So at the time Prophet Musa alayhi salam, the whole concept of magic, practicing magic and magicians, they were like the, the elite of a society, like an elite of a society, they employed magicians. They employed, like now people, let's, get, let's say, what, what would be a sign of someone who's rich in today's world? Private jet, right? That's why a lot of those who promise you, you know, get rich schemes, uh, overnight schemes, right? They usually, when they, when they film their, <laughs> their promotions, uh, promotion, promotional videos, what they, they usually film themselves either in their pri private jet or driving a Lamborghini or one of those like expensive cars, right? Why? Because everyone agrees that this is what it means to be rich. Mind you, most of those private jets are actually uh, rented, and these cars are rented, right? So at the time of Musa alayhi salam, a sign of wealth was that you had some magicians working for you, who would make a show and who would even help you. And we know the story, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi mentioned the story of uh, the young man, uh, right, who said to the king, if you, say, if you want to kill me, you say, La ilaha illallah, right? His father sent him to learn magic, magic from a magician, and on the way he found a priest or a, a worshipper, and he started frequenting the worshipper, learning from the worshipper, right? And uh, until he became a very righteous person, he became even more righteous than the worshipper himself. And then there was a beast on the way, uh, people could not pass, and then this young man came and he threw a rock on this beast and he said Bismillah and it killed the beast right and people then could pass so people started believing in him accepting his message then he was challenged by the king the king sent him to be killed a few times then he came back Allah saved him the king tried to kill him he couldn't kill him he said there's only one way you could kill me and the way you could kill me is basically by pointing with an arrow at my throat and saying Bismillah Rabbil Ghulam in the name of Allah Lord of this boy Right? And that's how he killed him, and then people became Muslim. They, they followed the religion of the... They said, the God of this boy must be, must be the true God, right? And this is when, they, when the king burned them. So, what was, the what was the boy learning? The boy was learning magic. Why? To serve in the court for the king, work for the king. So, the elite all had magicians at the time of Musa. So, magic was like the top paying profession at the time. And the rich ones would pay generously to employ these, these magicians. So it was the trend, Everyone was, everything was about magic and they had these uh, superpowers, they could, do, they could turn things, they could turn dust into gold, they could turn this into that and, and things like that. Uh, they could uh, manipulate people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Musa alayhi salam with a miracle that the, these people could relate to. So the staff turned into a snake. Now in their magic, they could turn a staff into a snake, but only through optical illusion. But for him, it was like a real thing. So it basically, it trumped their, their, their form of magic. It tend, it tend to be like insignificant compared to the miracle he came with. Uh, Prophet Isa alayhi salam, the, the miracle, one of the miracles that Allah gave him was healing the leper and sick people, terminally ill people, bringing the dead back to life, right? Why? Because medicine was the big thing at the time, especially in the Roman Empire. It was the big thing, medicine. At the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, definitely it was the language. It was the language. It was eloquency. And uh, the Quran, you know, just trumped all of their language. They couldn't argue with its beauty and with its profoundness and its correctness and its originality. But the Quran has many layers. Uh, in our times, linguistically, maybe it's not, it's not a big thing, linguistic and the Arabic language, but the Quran will always match and that's why Quran is the miracle of miracles. It matches any challenge. It matches any challenge. And, and again, that's a personal opinion. Uh, since today the world is so happy about, you know, uh, 
finding ways of life through science and education, improving the quality of life. Islam stands out. It can provide. It actually provides the best prescription for lifestyle, how to live. So at any time you will find the Quran matches the challenge and trumps it, a hundred percent. And that's why it's the miracle of all miracles. So that's a similarity again uh, between the message of, or the experience of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Musa Alaihi Wasallam, that <clears throat> the challenge was strongly relevant uh, to, uh, to the language or to the culture of the time. And also, he would put his hand inside of his garment uh, and he would, and Musa Alaihi Wasallam was of a darker color. He was dark brown color. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Musa ﷺ, he, he likened him, he said, كَانَ كَرَجُلٍ مِنْ أَزْدِ شَنُوءَ أَزْدِ شَنُوءَ uh, is a, an, an Arab tribe, and their skin is very, very dark, extremely dark brown. So he said, uh, when he saw Musa ﷺ during the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, he said, كَانَ كَرَجُلٍ مِنْ أَزْدِ شَنُوءَ He looked like someone from that tribe, أَزْدِ شَنُوءَ so Musa alayhi salam would pull his hand, it would be white. Only his palm would be white. And then it would return to its original color. But again, that was relevant as well to the whole concept of or profession of magic uh, at the time. So Fir'aun, he said, this is just, you know, this is sihrun azim. in هَذَا sihrun azim. He says, this is like cheap magic. It's obvious, we can, we can figure that out. It's a cheap form of magic. I can, I can show you what's real, what real magic is. So, again, instead of listening to the core of the message, he uh, went off at a tangent, right? The point was, hey, that this is a miracle from Allah, you just asked for a miracle, and I'm showing you a miracle from Allah, it's a sign, right? But now the sign became the topic rather than the message itself, rather than the content of the message itself. And again, this is... I think this is one of the fallacies. I forgot what's the name of it. But it's basically when you have an argument with someone, you can actually create a distraction. You, you avoid the main point and you take one side thing and you make it the point, make it the argument. And then the whole thing is wasted. And then uh, Musa tried to rally the people against, uh, oh, sorry, Fir'aun tried to rally the people against Musa. So he said, قَالَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْ قَوْمِ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّ هَذَا لَسَاحِرٌ عَلِيمٌ يريد أن يخرجكم من أرضكم بسحره فماذا تأمرون؟ This is definitely like a trained magician, and all he wants is to get you, basically take over and kick you out of this land. Oh, so he he's basically he's turning Musa عليه السلام into a threat to them. Just again, like the media, they're gonna like. Uh, some, some media outlets, they would say, you know, uh, yeah, Muslims are here to take over the world, right? So that they can demonize you. So Fir'aun tried to demonize uh, Musa alayhi salam and Harun. Now something similar was done again with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he wants, uh, right? So he basically ridiculed your forefathers, he looked down upon your religion, upon your, he desecrated you gods, right? So basically, they tried to demonize him, turn him into a threat to society, rally the people uh, against him. And then there was the confrontation. Uh, Fir'aun brought the magicians, there was like a display, uh, and everyone was brought, and the magicians came, and Musa said, you know, show me your... You know, your magic, where is it? So they threw their sticks or their uh, staffs and they, again, through illusion, optical illusion, they seemed as if though they were moving around. Again, but th this is something not religious, but this is some, you know, people tried to think what that actually means according to the technology of that time. They said these were tubes that were, were full of mercury. And mercury is liquid. And when you throw it, or you roll it, it has a momentum of its own. It keeps rolling, right? For a while. So, again, this is not, not religious. This is not a religious explanation. This is just mentioned, actually, in the books of Tafsir. Right? These were tubes full of mercury. 
and uh, and uh, basically it's in its natural te room temperature it's uh, you know uh, it's quite liquid and if you throw it it's actually it develops a momentum of its own and it looks as if it's wiggling so that's the source of optical illusion again this is just an explanation but Musa alayhi salam when he and it was so like captivating to the point that even Musa alayhi salam had a hint or a moment of fear but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, made the heart of Musa alayhi salam firm and he said just throw your staff and he threw, threw it and it turned into a proper snake that ate and it was like it wasn't only a snake it was a huge snake and it was moving so rapidly that it, it looked so unbelievable unbelievably scary and it devoured all of their sticks so that was something they were never exposed to and they realized man this is no, like we know we, we know magic inside out this is no magic this is just this is something else right so they realized no one could human being could have these powers it must be something else so they believed they accepted. Uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was challenged by the people of Mecca many times. They said, turn as-safa wal marwa into gold, right? And the Prophet ﷺ actually made dua. And Allah said to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, through Jibreel, in shi'ta, ja'ala Allahu lahum as-safa wal marwa tadahaban, fa in kafaru akhadahum. If you want, if you wish, Allah could turn Safa and Marwa into gold, but if they disbelieve after that, that's the end. Allah is going to take them out. But if you wish, Allah would not turn, Allah would not do that, and Allah would give them time. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, "No, keep them. I want to give them time because he knew them. He knew they were not sincere in challenging him. Then they challenged him to give him a miracle as well, uh, which was the splitting of the moon." And when that happened in front of their eyes, they said, no, that's optical illusion. They didn't accept it. The Prophet ﷺ went on the journey of Al-Isra wal miraj They made fun of him. They didn't believe in him. So there's a lot of similarity here. So when that, you can imagine when that actually came to Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he that like Musa ﷺ was in a similar situation. He had to deal with that, with a challenge. But eventually everything just turned out uh, to the destruction of Fir'aun and, and his people. And subhanAllah, something just to reflect upon the magicians, when they saw the sign, Iman came, Iman like unlocked through their hearts. And look at the, the, the sharp difference between Kufr and Iman as a, as a human, as a human condition. Before that, uh, before the challenge, in other other swarms, قال السحرة لفرعون إن لنا لا أجر إن كنا نحن الغالبين. This is are we going to get a reward? Are we going to get a treat if we win this challenge? قال نعم وإنكم إذا من المقربين. He said yes, and you shall be among the closest to me. I shall bring you even closer, higher in the social hierarchy, closer to me. You'll be my special people. So when they threw. When they threw, they took pride in themselves being, we are Fir'aun's people. We are the Pharaoh's people. That's who we are. That's the identity, the arrogance. And they were so confident of their magic and of the support of the Pharaoh. Because for them, Pharaoh is like, like God. But when they saw the sign of Musa alayhi salam, all of that crumbled. All of this illusion that they... Because pride is always based on illusion. When, the, when that crumbled, what happened? Fitrah surged. It came back. It took over the scene. So when they saw that, they realized, man, all, all, of, all of the lies of Fir'aun became exposed. Now, the truth, when the truth comes, falsehood disappears. You don't have to fight it. When truth, when, when truth, when truth comes... Falsehood dissolves, it's transmuted, it melts naturally. Why? Because that's its nature, because it doesn't have a real existence. It exists in people's minds. All of these illusions exist in people's minds. They have no true existence of, of themselves. So, 
when they saw that Iman surged, Iman came, like it's like a flood, it's like a dam, you break a dam and a flood erupts. So, uh, when they saw the sign, they went down prostrating. They said, we believe in the Lord of the worlds. He's the Lord of Musa and Harun. Because that awakened their faith. Now what happened? Fir'aun said, You accepted him, you believed in him before I gave you permission. Remember, I'm your God, right? I'm your, I'm your boss. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one who says yes and no. Now you are sort of escaping from my control. How dare you? And when you, spoke, when you speak about Fir'aun, he had, like, he had all the means you could think of at the time. Everyone else was powerless. I shall cut off your hands and your, and your feet and I shall crucify you to tree trunks. Meaning, I'm, I'm just, you're going to taste the worst pain, torture ever. How dare you? And this is a real threat. These are people who lived... It's not like these people grew up knowing that Fir'aun is somebody you could not mess with. That's it. Like it's not... It was for them more evident than anything else. So, so they were programmed to fear Fir'aun. But look at when Iman comes, it changes everything. Now Fir'aun is challenging them and they are face to face with him. They're not far from him. What happened? What did they say? They said... We don't care. Doesn't matter. La Doesn't matter. Eventually we will return to Allah. What can you do? Can you imagine the freedom? Can you feel it? <laughs> the freedom. Like they live their life in, 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 in captivity. Mental. Mental slavery. And Iman transformed them completely. Why? Because that fitrah, that Iman took over. All of the illusion, you know, disappeared, dissipated. Now there's only faith. And uh, in another surah, the response was, uh, We have believed in Allah, so He forgives our sins, our shortcomings. You do what you want. Like, you challenge Him openly, face to face. Like, it's unbelievable. It's like... Uh, it's like someone who, who suffers from some kind of fear of, of someone and then all of a sudden they break from that fear. Now this is the trauma completely disappearing. This is the paranoia completely cancelled. It's a new human being. You do whatever you want to do. Like, it, it's so care, like it's so carefree. <laughs> even, like you can't even say, say the word without feeling like, you know, do what you want. Go for it. You know, what's only in your hands. You can only make a judgment about this life. So do, do whatever you want. Like, do, do to us whatever you want to do. It's, it's all about this life. Everything changed. Just a second, a second ago, all they wanted was what? Are we going to get? A treat? Are we going to get gifts? Going to get rewarded for that? That's, that's all they wanted, right? And all they wanted to be closer to the Pharaoh. Like he gave them the most precious thing that could ever be given. The biggest honor, which is, you come, you come closer to me. But now all of a sudden, they don't even want that. They don't want that. That's, that's, what, that's what faith does. And the companions of the Prophet وسلم, the way they were transformed is more profound than this. Because they didn't even only go to challenge the Pharaoh or challenge even Quraysh or challenge even the whole of the Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula. What they actually did, Allah through them changed the course of history completely. The biggest transformation in a nation known in history. Like those scattered fighting Arabs they had no strategy, no vision, nothing. They, they, they didn't even have a civilization. All of a sudden, you bring them on, on, you actually place them right at the center of the map of the world, changing the face of earth completely. 
And again, not any change is positive. Again, if we, we're not speaking in secular terms or any change is okay, like it counts. No, but this is a change that brought humanity back to life. Okay, so, so this is a similarity as well. And then obviously the Pharaoh wanted to chase them and kill them. Uh, and he did chase them, but prior to that, there was an, uh, during a short period of time, uh, Allah gave Fir'aun and his people a chance by sending upon them some trials and tests. And these are mentioned as the miracles of Musa alayhi salam, verse number 133. Uh, فَأَرْسَلْنَا وَالْجَرَادَ وَالْقُمَّلَ وَالضَّفَادِعَ وَالدَّمَ آيَاتٍ مُفَصَّلَاتٍ فَاسْتَكْبَرُوا وَكَانُوا قَوْمًا مُجْرِمِينَ We sent upon them طوفان, floods. The Nile would flood and destroy their crops and all their vegetation. وَالْجَرَادَ Locusts. They would come and eat all of their produce. القُمَّل uh, القُمَّل Lice. Lice. Body and hair lice, obviously, tormented them and they couldn't get rid of it frogs frogs were you know just turning their life into hell everywhere there were frogs everywhere there is water there is frogs even in their drinking water there were frogs and they were making all of this this noise day and night they were driving them crazy like frogs were everywhere it's like a, a, an infestation of frogs uh, and this is another like test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that their drink sometimes would turn into blood. Like you have a cup of water, you want to drink, all of a sudden it turns into blood. And that made them made them feel disgusted. They couldn't for, for a while they couldn't have water to drink because it was all turning into blood. Some mentioned that the Nile itself turned into red colour over blood, real blood. Anyways, we we not we don't have any specific like narrations about the details. So when this happened, they realized, well, maybe this is a punishment from the Lord of Musa. So they went to Musa alayhi uh, salam, and Allah says in the following verse, وَلَمَّا وَقَعَ عَلَيْهِمُ الرِّجُزُ قَالُوا يَا مُوسَ دُعُوا لَنَا رَبَّكِ بِمَا أَحِدَ عِنْدَكِ They went to Musa and they said, you know, make dua to your Lord, pray to your Lord, you know, to take these things away from us. لَإِنْ كَشَفْتَ عَنَّ الرِّجْزَ لَنُؤْمِنَنَّ لَكَ وَلَنُرْسِلَنَّ مَعَكَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ if Allah removes that, all of these tests away, we shall believe in you and we shall hand you over the people of Israel. Because Musa was, was sent for, to the people of Israel eventually to save them from Fir'aun and from his tyranny. So Allah says, فَلَمَّا كَشَفْنَا عَنْهُمُ الرِّجْزَ إِلَىٰ أَجَلِهُمْ بَالِغُهُ إِذَا هُمْ يَنْكُثُونَ When we lifted all of these ailments and predicaments from them, they turned back on their heels and they did not fulfill their promise. Same thing. There, was many, there were many things with Prophet Muhammad They said, if you show us a sign, we would believe. The splitting of the moon it happened in front of their eyes. They said, no, that's magic. We don't believe in it. Saharakum ibn Abi Kabsha. That's what they said. They had a, a bad name for the Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abi Kabsha, the son of the father of the, the sheep. Right? So it was a, a condescending, sarcastic nickname. So... Saharakum ibn Abi Kabsha. He, he, he just created an optical illusion. He messed you up. Um, so many other things. Like they, would, they would say, you bring this sign, we would believe. The Prophet would bring the sign and they would not believe. Uh, so the same kind of attitude. Again, when you as a Prophet see that this had happened before, there's nothing new. That's the norm. And eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to establish uh, the, the truth. Eventually, obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused uh, Fir'aun uh, to drown. And Allah doesn't speak in detail about the end of the Pharaoh. He just mentions that uh, basically uh, we, we, we avenged the truth and we made them drown in the sea. Drown in the uh, in the sea. Uh, so Allah doesn't talk in detail. Why? Because there's no, no need to talk about details here. What, what the point here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you victory, O Muhammad, like He gave victory to Musa alayhi salam, and He will destroy the enemies. As simple as that. And then Allah 
it talks about Bani Israel and how they started you know, messing up with Musa alayhi salam, giving him a hard time. And what happened when there was a meeting between Musa alayhi salam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 40 days. And how was people during this time, they took all of the, the gold that they stole from the Egyptians. Again, look at these, these were believers at the time in Musa alayhi salam, right? They believed, they prostrated, they challenged Fir'aun. When Musa alayhi salam told them that Allah instructed me to escape, escape, run away, because Fir'aun is actually plotting to catch you guys. So Musa alayhi salam tells, tells them, hey, we, we have to, you guys get ready, we have to run away. What did they do? Because again, Bani Israel were working as what? Servants and slaves to the Egyptians. What did they do? They went to the houses of their masters, as usual, and they stole their, their jewelry. <laughs> they stole their jewelry. Theft. And these are what? Believers. They're not angels, because again, belief is, yes, I mean, there's a fitra, but you need to cultivate that. And it takes time, it takes dedication, it takes hard work to grow. Uh, so they stole the, the gold. And a sin leads to another sin. So when Musa alayhi salam was 40 days away from them, and Harun was looking after them, <laughs> what happened? Uh, there's a Samari. Again, one of the magicians, most learned magicians. These guys got bored and because they were under tyranny. These were people that you had to press them down. If you didn't press them down, they would turn into monsters. Unless you cultivate them. So Musa Islam was in the process of cultivating them. But they were just so impatient, so quick, that the moment they were, free, they were given freedom, they abused it. They started giving for uh, Harun alayhi salam, very hard time, tough time. Then the Samari, the biggest among them, what did he do? He, uh, he said, I saw, uh, he, basically the angel, okay, that's just another story in the books of Tafsir. Uh, when, when, when the angel split the ocean, for Musa alayhi salam and his people to escape through. And then the Pharaoh went in and the sea just came back and drowned them. One of the, the angel hit the ground with its wing. And there was some traces of that. It seems like it was some, some physical element. So a Samari caught that, he took it. This is in the Tafsir ibn Kathir. He took it, right? And he kept it with him. And it seemed that there was some magical, you know, impact of this material that he kept. So what he did, again, he was a magician, still his jahiliyyah is in him. So these guys were bored, they didn't know what to do. And uh, they came, فَمَرَّ بِهِمْ عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ يَعْكُفُونَ عَلَىٰ أَصْنَامٍ لَهُمْ قَالُوا يَا مُوسَ جَعَلْ لَنَا إِلَهًا كَمَّا لَهُمْ آلِهَا Right? Still, like, they, Musa was with them. They passed by a people who were worshipping statues, idols. These people felt jealous. They said, Musa, like, why can't we be like those people? They have <laughs> statues they can worship to. They can offer worship to. Why don't we, why can't we have the same? <laughs> right? قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ قَوْمٌ تَجْهَلُونَ He said, you guys are so ignorant. Like we saved you from this and you still, you know, gravitate towards it. You still want your own device. And that's a problem, by the way, with, this is something Ibn Khuldun said in his Muqaddimah, the famous scholar from, from Al-Andalus. He said, oppress people. The moment you take away oppression from them, they will gravitate to another oppressor. They got so used to being oppressed that being free is very uncomfortable for them. And this is something that is known. This is known in human behavior, even today in psychology. People who go through a trauma, actually there's part of them that does not, does not want to heal from the trauma. And usually people who are abused in a marriage, they will actually leave that marriage and move, usually gravitate to another abuser. 
because people need, tend to repeat the pattern. So Samiri, what did he do? He had an idea. We guys are bored, we don't know what to do. We don't know when Musa is going to come back, what is he going to bring? Probably Musa would never come back, right? So he said, bring all the gold you guys had, you, you took from <laughs> Egyptians, right? He melted that and he used these traces, whatever he had, the angel traces, whatever. Uh, and what he did, he molded the gold into a calf. What is a calf? Because I mentioned that in a, I don't know, in a, in a lecture and then uh, one of, it was students. And then one of the teachers sent me a note and he said, can you explain what a calf is? Because they don't know what a calf is. And I thought, really? Like, okay, but just let me make sure. I don't want to make the same mistake. Calf is what? The baby of a cow. Okay. Yeah, he made a, a, a calf. And he, uh, he basically said, قَالَ هَذَا إِلَهُكُمْ وَإِلَهُ مُوسَى فَنَسِي He says, this is your Lord. The Lord of Musa, he forgot. forgot. Forgot all about you. It might not make any sense, but by the way, psychologically, it makes so much sense. When you have a problem with your self-esteem, you don't see yourself worthy of anything, even of Allah's mercy. And we are guilty of this, by the way. Shaitan uses that. Like, oh, I did so many sins, Allah is not going to forgive me, right? Or maybe, you know, uh, why would Allah answer my dua? Who am I? It's insignificant. Uh, that's for the Prophet, and for the companions, for this righteous person, you know, but not for me. But you don't realize you're actually, this is not only a bad thought about you, but that's a bad thought about Allah, that Allah doesn't even care about His creation. That's a serious thing. Where did it come from? It came, came from you having a twisted understanding of who you are. So, so it appealed to them. Coming from that background, you worship things, right? You, ha you have to see. Again, worship is in the heart. It's not about the senses. We don't see Allah. You know, no one saw Allah with his own eyes. You know Allah in your heart. So this kind of tendency towards objectifying things, especially when it comes to worship, is very problematic. So the, they, they grew up with this habit. So they were craving it. They were addicted to it. So when, when that appealed to them and drew them in, all of them started offering worship to the golden calf. But it's not like uh, they were not aware it was not, it's not like it's just a piece of gold. But again, like, uh, again, usually people who commit shirk, people who come up with absurdities, they usually scaffold their lies and their uh, like nonsensical belief with what? With creating a logic around it, sophistication. And by the way, that's what we have today. Because 200 years from now, it's obvious that when, when humans study us our times, I think these people were stupid, man. Like it was obvious that this whole way of life is messed up, right? It's obvious, how, how come they couldn't see it? But again, there's a lot of logic and there's a lot of rhetoric around it, built around it. It sounds sophisticated. But if you strip it down to its essence, it doesn't make any sense. The way most of humans live, this global culture kind of globalization, doesn't make any sense from any perspective. Okay, so this was the case for them. Like, it's obviously for us, it's a very like, stupid idea. But for them, because they were, they, were, they were programmed into this kind of rhetoric and logic, it made so much sense to them. Like, how do you worship something you don't see? <laughs> something you can't touch. For them, that didn't make any sense. Like the people of Quraysh, they said, <laughs> Did he make the God, the many gods into one? That doesn't make any sense. Like for them, that's so strange. No, it's your belief that's strange, but because you are trained in it, you're programmed, you're conditioned, now you started to see the normal, healthy thing as strange. Okay, so again, same thing. Similar parallel. Uh, and eventually, obviously, Allah told Musa salam, that your people are worshipping the calf. And Musa salam, went back to them and he was very upset with them and 
Yeah, eventually, eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed some of them when they came to a meeting. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them by uh, bringing down a cloud upon them. And he said, you have to kill each other. Alhamdulillah, Allah saved the ummah of, of Islam from these very difficult punishments that he inflicted on people when they sinned previously. Because previously, in previous nations, when someone sinned, it was written on their door that so-and-so did such and such. They were exposed. And eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, now look at the beautiful crossover. Mentioning the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, then Allah talks about the content of the message that he gave to Prophet Musa alayhi salam about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So Allah says, uh, okay, Allah talks about the content of the message of Prophet Musa alayhi salam from verse 154 to 156, 157, Allah says al about the people who follow Musa alayhi salam, maktuban indahum fi tawrati wal injil. They are the ones who follow the messenger, the uh, unlettered messenger, that they find written and mentioned in the Torah and the Gospels. Torah wal Injil. يَأْمُرُهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَاهُمْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Then a description of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Beautiful crossover. After drawing parallels from the story of Prophet Musa to the story of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then from the story, from the content of the message of Prophet Musa Alaihi Wasallam establishing a very clear, strong case about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his message. And yeah, then there's an emphasis on the message of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then Allah talks about Bani Israel, how he divided the 12 clans and how he like, treated them in a very special way and then they abused that. And then Allah mentions a few stories with them among them when they, Allah pre prevented them from fishing on Saturday, being like a holy day for them and how they sought means around it and how Allah SWT punished them because of that. So there's a lot of details about uh, things that happened with Bani Israel and many of their, a lot of their misconduct towards the instructions and how always they were seeking means. That's a very common theme in, about Bani Israel. I was hoping that we could finish the surah, but again, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after just exposing Bani Israel and all of their like corruption, it's going to also draw a parallel from that to Quraysh and the Arabs who rejected the message at the beginning. So inshallah we're going to take that uh, next week and finish with Surah Al-Araf. And then we will wrap it all together bi Allah ta'ala. Yeah, jazakumullah khair for your attention and should, this should be enough inshallah for today. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.